You are watching my presentation on Recommendation 2, Integrate Writing and Reading to Emphasize Key Writing Features. Now, I wanted to point something out, and there will be a few things before this presentation actually begins that I'm going to be pointing out. Um, let's look at that thing that I circled there, the What Works Clearinghouse. Um, doesn't that remind you of like Looney Tunes where the coyote's trying to get the Roadrunner and he pulls out like a box of Acme something? Like that's what the What Works Clearinghouse reminded me of and I just wanted to say that. Just another footnote here. Was this the best picture that they could have used for teaching secondary students to write effectively? Now, this is a diverse and attractive group of students. However, like, are they doing any writing? Well, I guess this guy's holding a pencil in the middle there. Um, she's got a laptop on the right, but he appears to be staring at another girl in his group. And then there's another girl in the blue shirt who appears to be uh, staring at another girl in the group. And then there's a guy whose back is to us, but I'm sure that he's staring at a girl in the group too. And where's the teacher in all this? Oh, wait, yeah, he's blurry in the back there, doing something at his desk. I bet he's doing his taxes. So before we get on with the real part of this presentation, can we have a little fun first? I love looking at disclaimers because they pretty much tell you that anything you read here is actually not true or that it's been paid for by somebody who really wants you to say this thing and therefore you're saying it. This is what I found here. So the disclaimer here says that the opinions and positions expressed in this practice guide are those of the authors and do not necessarily, important word there, represent the opinions and position of the Institute of Education Sciences or the U.S. Department of Education. But then you see at the bottom, look at the question mark, U.S. Department of Education. They just put his name there. Like, they just put it there. Because, I don't know, reasons. They wanted to make it look like the U.S. Department of Education endorsed it. In the bold print, but in the fine print, it doesn't necessarily represent the opinions and positions of the Institute of Education Sciences or the U.S. Department of Education. So then they go on and on, should be reviewed, applied according to specific needs of educators, blah, 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 blah. But then they say this practice guide should be used as a tool to assist in decision making rather than as a cookbook. Ooh, surf and turf. I have never seen a metaphor in a bureaucratic publication before. They're supposed to be fantastically devoid of metaphors or anything creative. I don't get it. What is an IES practice guide for? Well, there's a fancy answer and there's a regular answer. Let's start with the fancy answer. This practice guide can help secondary educators who teach primarily at English language arts and social studies but the guide also emphasizes that it can be useful for those who teach science and math if their subjects require written responses in the following genres. Informational, technical, persuasive, reflective, expressive. And the regular answer is, it can pretty much help anyone who wants to read it. Honestly, anyone. So, of course, you're wondering, where can the IES practice guides be found? There are a couple of options. The first one, you can type in this long and complicated string of letters that you'll probably get wrong and end up with an error message. I don't recommend that. The second option, uh, I like to go practical. You can just type that into Google. Just type it in. It's the first hit. You'll find it. But... If you have an ideological thing against Google, which some people do, uh, the third option, just get in touch with that guy. His email address is right there, and he'll be happy to furnish you with an IES practice guide. 
Maybe we're getting a bit repetitive here, but I'm just following the outline, so here goes. Recommendation two, integrate writing and reading to emphasize key writing features. Number one, teach students to understand that both writers and readers use similar strategies, knowledge, and skills to create meaning. Number two, use a variety of written exemplars to highlight the key features of texts. Since this portion of the practice guide was not exactly rich on visuals, I included a picture of my cat who cannot read and a picture of my daughter at my desk in school on a day when she didn't have a full day of school reading. Photo taken without permission. This recommendation has many parts or themes. So, the first one is you can combine reading and writing in all academic subjects to encourage students to develop their writing in diverse contexts. The second one is you can practice writing skills in multiple areas of the curriculum in order to practice different types of writing. The third theme is that writing and reading use similar strategies. The fourth theme is that you should use multiple exemplars to demonstrate writing and reading strategies and to distinguish strong and weak exemplars. And finally, one can write across multiple disciplines because writing can improve reading comprehension and critical thinking. Even Figment knows that, and he's pretty dumb. And here is some serious information about evidence. The level of evidence assigned to each recommendation in these practice guides indicates the strength of the evidence for the effect of the practices on student achievement based on studies published since 1995 or published prior to 1995 and recommended by the panel. So, this recommendation has a moderate level of evidence and that is based on three studies that meet WWC group design standards without reservations, five studies that meet WWC design standards with reservations, Seven studies related to this recommendation found positive effects on at least one writing outcome, and the studies collectively demonstrated consistent positive effects, strong external validity, and strong internal validity. Boring. I'm going to level with you. The next couple of slides might be a little boring, so I'm going to back it with some upbeat music so that at least you can stay awake until we get to the interesting part. Here we go. All right, so here are the steps to carry out this recommendation. First, you remind students that both writers and readers use similar strategies, knowledge, and skills to create meaning. Second, you identify connections between reading and writing by helping students recognize cause and effect structure when reading. Use the same structure while writing. Alert students to signal words to indicate cause and effect. Help students understand that just as readers use strategies to decipher text and meaning, writers use strategies to infuse their text with meaning. Include mental pictures for visualization and sensory details. Show students how writers create meaning for readers by providing annotations on the meanings or exemplar texts to highlight the ways writers engage readers by setting up the context and focus of that text. Use cognitive strategy sentence starters to help students structure their thinking and writing. Model 1. What writers might say to themselves while composing. 2. What readers think when annotating texts they are reading. And 3. How writers generate ideas for texts they are writing. Use activities that integrate writing and reading to enhance skills and knowledge in reading and writing across disciplines, such as activities that use keywords and phrases from a story, story impressions, to help students develop knowledge of text features that writers use in drafting specific narrative genres. 
When reading multiple texts on the same topic, students can evaluate and synthesize information into a cohesive summary either individually or in groups of students. Finally, help students develop extended research arguments that incorporate opposing perspectives by reading diverse viewpoints, writing persuasive essays, reviewing and evaluating a peer's writing, and revising their own writing. Last one, I promise. Use a variety of written exemplars to highlight the key features of the text. Use exemplars to teach students key features of effective writing so that they can use them on their own. These features include strong ideation, organization and structure, word choice, grammar, punctuation, spelling, use of literary devices, banging your head against the wall, sentences meeting the writer's intentions, voices, tone mood style, use of correct conventions. While reading exemplar texts emphasize features that align with a specific learning objective being taught, color coding is one way to do this, unless your kids are colorblind and then you'll have to be more creative. They also recommend discussing as a class the definitions of the things that are being examined in the exemplars, such as themes. This entire practice guide was not very big on visuals, however, they did provide a few examples, which are mostly text with a couple of icons of kids sitting at desks with laptops. Uh, but that said, you are all capable of reading. You can probably read these yourselves. So I'm going to pause for about 30 seconds or so, and I will let you read them yourself. Um, but I'll give you a little soundtrack of a bunch of kids from Barcelona singing a version of I Spy. Here you go. Let's talk about some articles. This one comes from Germany, and it's by a bunch of people whose names I can't pronounce, but one of them looks like Knuckles, which is cool, so I'll keep it. So, it says in the practice guide that the treatment occurred in one session, but this is misleading. If you read the article, you'll find it was way more complicated. This is what it really says. The students attended a pair of sessions that were kind of like practice sessions in which they were walked through the process of a study. Then another session to determine whether the information from the first session sunk in. Then they did it all again, this time for realsies. There was a lecture session on social psychology and instruction on one of four modes of instructions on how to write a learning journal, followed by a writing a learning journal, followed by a comprehension test. Then another round of lectures, but on a different topic, but without direct instruction on how to write a learning journal. And then they wrote in a learning journal and took a test on the topic. <gasps> okay, we have a problem here. And the problem is this, anyone who's taught like ever knows that if you give an assignment that has more than five instructions, it's not getting done. It's not getting done correctly and it's just not getting done. So the next article I actually liked. It was by a guy named Robert Stevens and don't tell me that you didn't see Robert Louis Stevenson when that came up on the slide. Anyway, this study was really cool, but it wasn't really because of the study itself. In fact, the study itself was a sort of pedestrian romp through group work and how peer feedback uh, enhances writing. Uh, pretty normal, right? Okay, but here's what I liked about it. This article actually had some personality. The suggestion was, let's change a lot of things about education. And the first thing to change about education is to just get rid of middle school. This guy thinks middle school sucks, which it does. And his criticism is that it is sort of a prison in which kids are taught a lot of rote, boring stuff 
in subject matter that's divided arbitrarily just at about the time when kids are wanting to think independently and wanting to solve real problems. I thought it was really insightful. And his suggestions were along the lines of don't teach middle school the way you're teaching middle school. Just get rid of it. Teach kids what they're interested in and what they can apply to their real lives. And the second thing is to get rid of a bright line between subjects. So reading and writing shouldn't just be an English class. It should span all the subjects. Essentially, he was saying, let's be Finland because that's the way they do it there. That is the education system. And one of the things that gets repeated every single year around a week from now is that Finnish students are the happiest and most successful in the world, even though they rarely ever have homework and they don't learn to read and write until they're eight years old when they are intellectually ready for it. So, Finland. I don't want to do justice to bad teachers who complain, so I'm just going to show the obstacles that a few not so good teachers might put up in order to say that they can't do these things that the practice guide suggests. Here goes. My favorite part of this project is the disclosures of potential conflicts of interest. So, who do we have here? We have Carol Booth Olson. Carol Booth Olson, who is she exactly? There she is. So, she's this so-called professor at the University of California, Irvine. But you see, she did a lot of the studies in this practice guide. And you know what? She wrote a book about the studies she did in this practice guide, and then she recommended them. So what does that make her? Huh, well, that makes her the Professor Emerita, which means she's retired. She no longer works there. You know where she is now? She's right there. And this is the thank you page. Bye everybody. Not a question, but...